function effectively, the United Nations needs civil society. The UN Charter acknowledges NGOs' participation in the United Nations. Non-governmental organizations monitor and report on whether human rights are respected in their communities. They submit information, make statements and hold events in human rights bodies of the UN. To participate most fully, NGOs need consultative status. Applications for such accreditation are reviewed by the UN's NGO committee. This 19-member committee is a key gateway for NGOs into the UN. The job of the NGO committee is to make sure that only NGOs that act in conformity with the spirit, purposes and principles of the United Nations receive consultative status. However, political interests are very evident in the committee's practice. The membership is dominated by states with an interest in keeping some NGOs out of the UN. Increasingly, the committee lives up to its reputation as the anti-NGO committee. The NGO committee meets twice a year to review applications. And when a member needs more information about an applicant, they can ask a question. When a question is asked, the application is deferred to the next session. I thank the distinguished representative of China for your question that will be transmitted to the organization so that the committee is uh, uh, duly informed as to the responses received. Perpetual questioning, however, can just be a procedural tactic to block NGOs. There are questions asked that in theory could be asked forever. I will kindly ask the organization to provide the committee with their recent projects and activities. We want to ask this uh, NGO to provide the newest uh, financial statements. The committee thrives on secrecy. However, some NGOs monitor committee sessions closely. Fabiana Paradi sat through the committee's first 2017 session. At the most recent session, human rights organizations had a 27% likelihood of successfully gaining accreditation, while non-human rights organizations had a 61% chance. This means that human rights organizations were twice as likely to have their applications deferred. Amongst human rights NGOs, those that face most obstacles are organizations working on sexual and reproductive rights, the rights of LGBTI people, and the rights of minorities. The case of the International Dalit Solidarity Network shows how NGOs will not be deterred by the committee practice. IDSN's application has been blocked for almost 10 years and counting. They received 80 questions, all from one state. The comprehensive answers they provided to the questions they receive are met with more questions. There is nothing that prevents the committee from asking the same questions repeatedly. So my name is Cindy Maria and I work for Christian Solidarity Worldwide. And as an international human rights advocacy organization, the United Nations is one of the key platforms, one of the most important platforms for us to engage with. So CSW decided to apply for ECOSOC consultative status in 2009. Um, we have really tried to do everything we can um, to provide comprehensive and timely answers to all the questions that have been asked by the committee. We have attended the NGO committee meetings here in New York several times. So we called for a vote on our case because it's been pending for a very long time. And unfortunately, the NGO committee decided on Friday the 3rd of February to no. reject our application. No. 11 out of the 19 NGO committee members voted to deny us the access to the United Nations. After years of being blocked, for some NGOs, only a vote of the Economic and Social Council, ECOSOC, the parent body of the committee, can grant them accreditation. The Council will now vote on draft decision E-2017-L16 slash slash entitled Application of the Non-Governmental Organization Christian Solidarity Worldwide 
for consultative status with the Economic and Social Council. However, to secure a win, requires the investment of huge political capital. So states rarely call for votes at ECOSOC. Few NGOs can rely on such support. Connectus is a human rights organization from Brazil, and we work to strengthen the Global South voice and the international human rights movement, and also work to fight against human rights violations in Brazil. The committee is required to pay particular attention to applications of NGOs from developing countries. However, some NGOs from the Global South face multiple deferrals of their applications, keeping them out of the UN. The UN is important to promote and protect human rights, but for civil society from Brazil and other countries from the Global South, it's not very easy to have access to the UN. So being here in New York, it's not a common opportunity for us. It's not very accessible because it's very expensive and we also have to deal with many other resource constraints. So the NGO committee should be open and really promoting civil society participation and having special attention to Global South voices. Otherwise the UN will be only a body very far away from our own realities on the ground. Recently the committee has started to ignore its own procedures. My name is Mehmet Kuluc, I'm the main representative of the Journal of Sound Writers Foundation to the United Nations. The Journal of Sound Writers Foundation was established in Istanbul, Turkey in 1994. After the acquisition of the consultative status, we moved our headquarters to New York. On the opening session of the NGO committee in 2017, one member state wanted our status to be withdrawn, claiming that we are inexistent because they closed down the organization in Turkey. But however, we have been operating our activities from New York since 2014. ECOSOC 1996-31 clearly states that the non-governmental organization concerned shall be given written reasons for a decision to recommend suspension or withdrawal of its status and shall have an opportunity to present its response. Because the organization was closed down in Turkey it doesn't mean that we are in existence. We are concerned that the committee voted to ignore this rule and to not even notify the NGOs that they had been suspended, let alone allow them to respond. We find it really unfair that it is an arbitrary and a political decision. Some states have expressed concern that the practice of the committee could constitute reprisals against NGOs seeking to cooperate with the UN. The last session of the NGO committee witnessed the rejection of a significant number of NGO applications on spurious or politically motivated grounds. For us, we are seriously troubled by the willingness of the committee to set aside the rules of procedures established. We have been continuously observing the protracted mistreatment of a number of applications, delaying or even rejecting submissions for political reasons or as sanctions or reprisals. NGOs from developing countries particularly suffer from sluggish evaluation uh, processes which are of doubtful legitimacy. The withdrawal of consultative status may be used as a form of reprisal for the activities of NGOs. After years of calls for greater transparency, in April 2017, the Economic and Social Council finally voted to webcast all open sessions of the committee. This was a great step forward, but more will be needed to ensure NGOs' participation is encouraged, not hindered. Most importantly, we need to encourage states with a positive record on safeguarding civil society space to put themselves forward as candidates of the NGO committee. Civil society voices need to be heard at the United Nations.